Hello and welcome to another Sci-Fi Night special. I'm your host, Sebastian Vendel Martinez, and hey everybody, happy Halloween! So anyway, in my last episode, I did a top 5 list with my buddy Joseph Ari, and when we got to a number 1 spot, The Thing, I kind of wimped out. That's because I love this movie so much that I want to talk about it in depth in this Sci-Fi Night special. 1982's The Thing, directed by John Carpenter, is not only one of my favorite sci-fi and horror films ever, but it's also my favorite film to watch on Halloween, as established in my top 5 Halloween movie segment that I did with Joseph Ari, which you can view by clicking here. So I guess most of us already know the story. A research team working out in Antarctica find another research site that seems to have been ravaged by disaster, or quite possibly the worst bachelor party ever. They eventually realize that this is the work of a hostile alien being capable of shape-shifting into anything it comes into contact with and replicating it perfectly. So stuck in one of the most isolated parts of Earth, still not as isolated as North Korea but you guys get the idea, the research team has to figure out who's an alien and who's a real human. The reason this is such an amazing Halloween film is the ambience. It's perfect for a spooky evening and the isolated feel and great cinematography in combination with a minimal but well-constructed score make this such an atmospheric film that just draws you in and creates the same feeling of isolation around you, you might as well be out in Antarctica along with them. Basically it's a perfect film to put in, switch out the lights for, and just get drawn into an alternate reality where you can forget about everyday life and terrifying things like Donald Trump running for president in favor of less terrifying stuff like a shape-shifting alien trying to kill humanity. Obviously, I love this film, it's one of my all-time favorites, and I just think everything is spot on. The acting is terrific, direction is great, cinematography is awesome, and the effects still to this day stand out as some of the best practical effects ever put on screen, and as well as some of the grossest. You gotta be fucking kidding. Also, never really knowing he was human and he was an alien leaves a constant sense of tension that really strengthens the film. So in celebration of Halloween and this excellent film, let's find out what you guys might not know about this movie, starting with the beginning. The film's origins begin with a 1938 sci-fi novella, Who Goes There, written by John W. Campbell Jr. under the name Don A. Stewart. The book takes place in Antarctica and is about a group of scientific researchers who discover an alien spacecraft that crashed there 20 million years ago. They end up thawing up one of the aliens, which is a shape-shifting being capable of imitating the creatures it devours. The research team are struck with paranoia and must deduce who is an alien imitation and who is real. Due to more alien infection and the use of a blood test to determine who is actually human, the scientist numbers get reduced until they actually manage to kill off the alien and save the day. So if that all sounds very similar to the 1982 John Carpenter film, that's because he made a very faithful adaptation of the book, right down to using some of the same names like McCready and Blair, and as well as several key set pieces that were used in both the film and the book. In 1951, the book was adapted into a film directed by Christian Nyby called The Thing from Another World. The film, for some reason, takes place on the opposite end of a planet by being set on the North Pole instead of the South. So why make an adaptation and have it set on the opposite end of a planet? Well, because they could get away with it, that's fucking why. The North and the South Pole look identical. Still though, it's kind of stupid and unnecessary. Oh, don't apologize. Also, in the 1951 film, the team is sent out to investigate a crashed spacecraft that just recently appeared on Earth, as opposed to discovering an ancient alien wreck. Look there. Half the compass is in a spin. Geiger's up to the top. The team discovers an alien frozen in the ice and decide not to thaw it, but some asshole accidentally thaws it out by putting an electric blanket over it because he was frightened by it and didn't want to look at the alien. That's better. Alright, look Mr. Idiot, if you thought it was scary when it was frozen in the ice, imagine how scary it's gonna be when it's trying to kill you. The film takes a big departure from the original novella, and that the alien is just another big brutish monster not possessing any shape-shifting abilities at all. What is it? Looks like a man. Yeah, it's got legs and a head. I can see him. Yeah, he 
must be over eight feet long. Somebody got out of that saucer. Got out or was thrown out and frozen fast before he could get clear. In the film, they examine some of the alien remains and deduce that it's actually an advanced plant-based life form, which leaves behind seeds that grow at an alarming rate, which risk evolving and spreading. In the end, the plant-based monster is killed by electricity because, I don't know, 1950s science? And the film ends with one of the most iconic lines in sci-fi history. I bring you a warning. Every one of you listening to my voice, tell the world. Tell this to everybody wherever they are. Watch the skies everywhere. Keep looking. Keep watching the sky. There was another adaptation of the book Who Goes There in 1972 called Horror Express, but it's pretty different and really has nothing to do with the 1982 film The Thing, so we'll just kind of gloss over it. So with those two previous adaptations out of the way, let's move on to what is basically the seminal adaptation of Who Goes There, John Carpenter's The Thing. So let's check out the making of this classic film. Universal decided to go ahead with making The Thing after the success of films like Alien and John Carpenter's Halloween. They decided to give Carpenter his first big break in major filmmaking simply because of how well he handled the horror masterpiece Halloween. The film was shot both on sound stages in Los Angeles, but as well as in British Columbia, Canada. The film took around three months to shoot and was unusually expensive for a film of that sort as it got a budget of $15 million. Now compare that to Carpenter's Halloween, which only had a budget of around $375,000. So it sure says a lot that Universal were willing to give Carpenter a budget more than 10 times of that that he actually had on Halloween, and boy are we glad that he did. The film is pretty unique for 1980s sci-fi horror as there are no women in the film at all. This has over the years strengthened the film as there are no useless romantic subplots or stereotypical damsels in distress. The only non-male presence in the entire film is a female voice on McCready's computer, and it was none other than John Carpenter's wife at the time who did the voice acting for the chess program. Your move, king to rook one. My move, rook to knight six. Checkmate. Checkmate. Shoot the bitch. Originally, there was supposed to be a female scientist in the film, but the actress who was supposed to play her got pregnant and had to leave the set, being replaced by a male actor. So we all love Kurt Russell as McCready in the film, right? Well, guess what? He almost didn't star in it. The role of McCready was first offered to Nick Nolte, Jeff Bridges, and Clint Eastwood, but they all turned it down. Get off my lawn. Of course, luckily for us. The character of McCready was also originally supposed to have a backstory as a helicopter pilot who served in Vietnam, but this never made it into the finished film. Filming in British Columbia was harsh, like really harsh, and that's because they actually filmed in the snowfall capital of North America, and it actually costed them $75,000 just to keep the cast and crew warm. Now that's dedication. Part of what makes the film so atmospheric is the dark and minimalistic soundtrack. Originally, composer Jerry Goldsmith was booked to do the score. He had previously done the music for films like Star Trek and Motion Picture, but he decided to pass on the thing. The excellent Ennio Morricone, known for Once Upon a Time in America and The Good, The Bad and the Ugly, amongst other films, instead took on the role as composer. He collaborated with Carpenter, who usually wrote his own music for almost all his films except for this one. And despite the fact that he didn't even speak a common language, they managed to produce something truly unique and timeless. One of the things that is perhaps the most memorable in this film is the amazing practical effects and boy was there a lot of work that went into doing them. As this was before CGI, obviously all the effects were practical. Relative newcomer Rob Botton did the amazing special effects and he was only 22 years old at the time. I begged him to introduce me to John Carpenter, you know, I said I gotta work with this guy. He had previously worked on effects heavy films like Star Wars, but he was only an assistant makeup artist and wasn't even listed in the film's credits. Now, Botton's creations are amazing and timeless, 
but they definitely came at a cost. In the classic autopsy scene where Norris's head separates and sprouts legs, there were some live flames on set. However, there was also flammable materials and gases that were used which caused the set to catch fire. Luckily, no one was hurt, but the props and special effects models that Botkin had spent months working on were all destroyed. Months of work preparing for this moment was just blown to bits in, in just a second, so we you know, put it out with fire extinguishers and stuff like that, and, and then he just goes, oh my god. We had to set up, take a whole other day to get back to this point, and finally just accomplish the one shot. Now, some people might have given up after a disaster like that, but not Botkin. He got right back to work. He worked so tirelessly on the thing that he literally lived in the studio certain days. He worked so hard that he had to take a break from work due to being diagnosed with exhaustion and had to be admitted to the hospital. When Botkin was in the hospital, special effects legend Stan Winston took over the handling of special effects, but Winston was so impressed by the work of a young talent Botkin that he didn't want to overshadow him and asked that he not be credited for the effects. Instead, he received a special thank you at the end of the film. After the thing, Botkin would go on to do special effects for movies like Robocop, Total Recall, Seven, and even an episode of Game of Thrones, and I'm glad to say that it's one of my favorite episodes. So even though this film is considered a classic in today's day and age, and I say rightfully so, it definitely wasn't when it was first released. No, in fact it got a pretty shitty reception. Yep, that's right. Despite this being John Carpenter's favorite film with a nice 8.2 rating on IMDb, the film did not do well when it was released and received a negative reception from both critics and audiences alike. What the fuck is this? They complained that there was too much gore and effects and also that the tone of the film was too bleak and dark. It's a crack of shit. The New York Times called it foolish, depressing, and overproduced. Roger Ebert was disappointed by the film, The Washington Post called it a wretched excess, and Newsweek claimed that Carpenter had blown it. It's weird and pissed off, whatever it is. So if you're a fan of a thing, then leave your jaw on the floor, because there's more bad criticism where that came from. The film costed $15 million to produce and opened at 8th place in the box office, which isn't particularly encouraging. To depress things even more, the film only made around $19 million for a $4 million profit, which is by no means an economic success. The Thing was released just two weeks after E.T. though, and on the same day as Ridley Scott's Blade Runner, so it had both tough competition, as well as an audience that all of a sudden had a very different perception of aliens. Yeah, I mean, think about it. America had just fallen in love with a peaceful alien E.T., and the next thing you know, you got a horrible monsters ripping people to shreds and sprouting heads wherever. I mean, obviously, it's a pretty big difference. So I guess you could say there was some pretty bad timing involved here, but I don't know if that's the only thing that went against it. The thing was actually even originally banned in Finland for having such graphic depictions of violence and gore. And get this, the film was nominated for a Razzie Award for Worst Soundtrack. So yeah, you got that right. This film was criticized for its effects, its atmosphere, and its soundtrack, three of the things that make it great. And that just goes to show you how ahead of its time this movie really was. That didn't stop Carpenter from taking it all very hard, and he's been quoted as saying the following. I take every failure hard. The one that I took the hardest was the thing. My career would have been different had it been a big hit. The movie was hated, even by science fiction fans. They thought that I had betrayed some kind of trust, and the piling on was insane. Even the original movie director, Christian Nyby, was dissing me. Luckily, this film would age gracefully like a fine wine because it's today considered an absolute classic, and in my opinion, it's one of the top five sci-fi horror movies ever made. The film still lives on though, and it's left quite a legacy behind it. The 1993 X-Files episode Ice is a direct homage to the thing, which is pretty noticeable when you watch it as it's about a group of people stranded on a research station in a snowy climate with a virus that infects and takes people over. It was inspired by the thing, as uh, anyone who knows the genre will tell you. Carpenter's version of a story was also adapted into a video game for Windows PC, PlayStation 2, and Xbox in the year 2002. The game takes place in the same location as the Carpenter film, and contains plenty of nods to the film. Despite a few glitches, bugs, and graphics that haven't aged all that well, I actually really like the video game version of the thing. What's interesting is the squad dynamics, 
as you encounter medics, engineers, soldiers, and so forth, as for some reason Antarctica became extremely populated. I'm locked, loaded, and ready to make shit dead. The film's theme of anyone being able to be an alien is translated into the game as your squadmates can end up turning into aliens, some of them might already have been a thing when you first met them. You can both test your squadmates over human status using blood tests, and also reassure them of your own human status. We got the kid? Good. The report said the hypo contains a chemical that reacts with blood. Do it. We'll soon know, one way or another. Now I'm gonna show you what I already know. Maybe they won't trust you until you've given them a weapon, and if they don't help you, you might not be able to proceed to the next stage. There was also a novelization of a film, as well as a series of comics released by Dark Horse in 1991. The legacy of a thing would however get rejuvenated as of a couple years back. So as with everything that's considered a classic, a reboot, sequel, remake, or re-something is bound to happen, and the thing is no different. In 2001, a prequel of a thing was released, given the extremely confusing title of just The Thing. The people who made the prequel convinced Universal to make a prequel instead of a remake, as we felt that Carpenter's version was perfect, and that doing a remake would be like painting a mustache on the Mona Lisa. However, they couldn't think of a good subtitle for the film, so they just called the prequel The Thing. The 2011 film tells the story of what happened at the Norwegian camps before Kurt Russell and company showed up. In the film, the Norwegian research team discover a crashed alien spacecraft and they recruit two American scientists to help. Because you can't expect people to read subtitles in an American film, no, of course not. There were a lot of practical effects used at the core of a production, but most, if not all of it, was masked with CGI, which I really think is a shame. When you're doing a prequel to a movie famous for its practical effects, why not continue with what made the film so great? Also, it's kind of hard to watch the film and not think, oh, well, geez, I already know what's gonna happen on account of it being a prequel. And while most of the monster designs and effects were pretty alright, some seemed a bit too derivative of the first, and the others just kind of seemed a bit silly. Despite plenty of flaws, I still mostly enjoyed the 2011 prequel to The Thing, as they put a lot of hard work into it to make sure that it tied in with the first classic. From the placement of things in the Norwegian camp, to the remains of monsters that are created in the prequel and later show up in the 1982 film, there sure are a lot of connections and preludes to the events of a 1982 classic. This is what ties the two films together pretty well. One great example is the split-faced monster whose body is discovered in the 1982 film, which plays a big part in the 2011 prequel. However, I feel that they showed off too much of the monsters, and that the film at times gets way too cliché and far removed from the style of a 1982 film. So, is the 2011 version as good as the 1982 classic? No, of course not. I mean, it's basically all CGI. Still though, think of it as a nice dip sauce to your main course. Still though, that's not where the legacy ends. From video game modifications, to just tons of love from the sci-fi horror community, The Thing is a seminal and important film in sci-fi horror history. It's a true classic that's aged incredibly well and remains a favorite amongst many sci-fi horror fans. Despite all the production problems and the really bad reception it got from fans and critics alike upon release, it still stands strong today and really only got such a reception because of how ahead of its time it was. I mean, yeah, it wasn't the film's fault that it got shitty reviews. The film was just better than the people at the time could handle. Obviously, I love this film, and you should too. Yeah. Why don't we just wait here for a little while, see what happens. So that does it for this Sci-Fi Night special on The Thing by John Carpenter. We hope you enjoyed it, and let us know what you think of a movie. What's your favorite moment? What's your favorite creepy ass or gross ass part of the film? Let us know in the comments below. Be sure to click the like and subscribe button to help out the show and stay updated with it. Happy Halloween once again, and we'll catch you guys next time. How long have they been stationed there? 
says here only eight weeks. Well, that's not long enough for guys to go bunkers. Bullshit, Barney. Five minutes is enough to put a man over down here. Damn straight. I mean, look at Plum. He been the way he is since the first day. 